Hello? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, first of all, let me thank you for uh, letting me be your teachers. Uh, the honors program has been my life, the meaning of my life for many years. And uh, uh, if the truth be, be known, I'd pay you to let me teach you. <laughs> it, uh, it's uh, not something I do, it is something I am. I'm here to tell a different story now. Uh, a story about 1971, March 8th, 1971, when eight of us broke into uh, the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania and stole a lot of documents, sorted them uh, into uh, criminal documents, about 40%. And then clearly political documents, about 60%, and mailed them off to newspapers. The story of 1971, for me, began 10 years earlier, in 1961. Uh, 1961 in May, I was a Methodist minister uh, in a small church out in Long Island, so talk at Long Island. And I think it was in May, early May, uh, a letter arrived at my desk. It was a mimeograph letter, not personalized from an outfit that I kind of knew a little bit about, but not very much, CORE, Congress on Racial Equality. Uh, and it was signed by a guy, I, his name I more or less knew something about, Jim Farmer. And it was simply asking, uh, again, it was anonymous in the sense that uh, it wasn't directed to me personally. Uh, uh, they were asking for white folks uh, who would be willing to uh, join with black folks and travel down south on buses and test uh, whether or not uh, the uh, the bus stations were in fact integrated, which they were supposed to be according to the Supreme Court at the time, but of course nowhere in the South was that the case. And I kind of naively said, oh, well sure, and I'll mail it back, expecting nothing to happen. And about two weeks later, there was Jim Farmer's deep, baritone voice on the telephone to me saying, yes, we want you, Reigns, come to, pit, to, come to St. Louis. So I went to St. Louis, not really knowing what I was getting myself into, uh, I, was a, I was a privileged white boy. Uh, I was, none of us get to choose our birth, of course. Uh, I was born into a family of, of class privilege. I went to private schools and all those things. Uh, live in maids, oh Lord. A governess, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, uh, you don't choose these things. But uh, my first education, my first identity, my first way of living in the world and therefore understanding the world that I lived in was from top down. I was living inside of a bubble, uh, a bubble called privilege and power. But none of my teachers back then ever told me that. We were not uh, informed that we, special quotation marks few, were living inside of a bubble called privilege and power. And understanding the world and forming my first identity, in fact, uh, as a person living the world, understanding the world, shaping my own identity, my own moral conscience from top down. We were dumb. We had a wonderful education, but we were dumb. We understood the world from the point of view of a tiny, tiny minority. That's why it was so important for me in my moral formation to go south in 1961 as a freedom writer. We left St. Louis for Little Rock, Arkansas, the morning of July 10th, 1961. We arrived in Little Rock about 7.30 in the evening. There was a mob there. That mob intended to do bodily harm to us. It's the first time in my life I really confronted violence. I was naive about that. I wouldn't remain naive very, very long, but I didn't really know that uh, if you sided with blacks, if you were a black struggling for your freedom back then, if you sided with those blacks, uh, you became a target. We were arrested. The charge was a threatened breach of the peace. That was a very appropriate arrest. We did threaten and want to breach that unholy peace of legalized segregation. When the law becomes the instrument of oppression, then the only way you can stop that oppression is to violate the law that creates the oppression. 
That's what we did. It was the first time I would be sentenced to jail, not the last. <laughs> How did it happen to that sweet little boy from Minneapolis, Minnesota, <laughs> at Blake School, you know, all that kind of... Anyway, uh, Judge Quinn Glover, a white guy of class privilege like me, my kind, so to speak. But now I was in a place I'd never been before. I was in a place where I was outside of power, in a place where power viewed me as the enemy of their own power and privilege and had the power to punish me for that, and did. Judge Quinn Glover took us into chambers before finding us guilty, and he said, I want you to know why I'm going to find you guilty, because if I don't, I won't get reelected. Yeah, so he said, my dad, back in Minneapolis, Minnesota, played golf <laughs> with the leading judges of Minneapolis, with the, the mayor, the senators, I mean, you know, I was, Law was on my side. Law was the expression of my kind, the protectors of my kind. And now, I started a second education about law, power, and privilege. We were found guilty, sentenced to six months in jail, and $500 fine. The powers that be of Little Rock didn't want to have another major national event in Little Rock, so they leaned upon the judge. That's how it works, you know. And the judge said, okay, you can go. And that was my first interesting introduction to what power and the law looks like, lives like, from bottom up rather than top down. Now that began an education I wasn't supposed to get, but an education I desperately needed. I was so dumb. My kind were so dumb back then that we didn't even know we needed an education. Top-down living was great for me. Uh, we were dumb. Well, I would go south again in 64 to Freedom Summer. I would go south to the Selma March in 65, and I would go south again later in 65 as a voting registration. Uh, actor uh, in southwest Georgia. Those of us who were part of the civil rights movement had learned about J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was dead against the civil rights movement. He was convinced and he wrote to all of the people he could influence, and he had a lot of influence, that Martin Luther King was a communist and that the whole movement was communist inspired. That's how he felt. That's how he used his agents and didn't use his agents. He, we learned from those experiences that J. Edgar Hoover's FBI used dirty tricks and everything they could to discredit and to dismantle the civil rights movement. At one point, we found this out later because of the files we took. At one point, at one point, J. Edgar Hoover had his agents write an anonymous note to Martin Luther King, threatening him with blackmail and suggesting that the only thing for him to do now was to commit suicide. That was J. Edgar Hoover. That was the secret J. Edgar Hoover. The public J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover in the 50s and 60s was the most popular man in Washington, more popular than presidents. Not only the most popular, he was the most powerful. He had been head of the FBI for almost five decades. There was no senator, there was no congressman, there weren't even presidents who would hold that guy and what he was doing with his FBI accountable. They were either enamored of him or they were terrified of him. In any case, they were silent. That's what we faced when we came back north and my wife and I and others joined in the anti-war protest movement. Here in Philadelphia, that was a hot, hot item in 67, 68, 69, 70, 71. In some ways, Philadelphia was a national center for resistance and protest against that war, partly because of the Quaker background, partly because of the intense representation of institutions of higher education in and around this city. That was going to be very important for our successful way of hiding. More of that in a bit. 
in December of 1970, a physics professor, a mathematician, a guy by the name of Bill Davidon, teaching at Haverford College, called my wife and I on a telephone. We knew him because we were involved in the anti-war movement, and he was as well. Especially he was involved in the same part of that movement that we were, the East Coast Conspiracy to Save Lives. Back in 1969, 70, those of us who had been active in the, in the peaceful protest, the nonviolent protest movement, were getting very tired. It was not working. So we began to think about the movement from nonviolent protest to nonviolent disruption. And a group called the East Coast Conspiracy to Save Lives, the Berrigan brothers were the ones who formed that group, had begun exactly that task. They were attacking selective service offices. The can uh, 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 at Catonsville 10. They would stand by, get arrested, and put in jail. Well, that seemed finally not a very good tactic. <laughs> Your troops were being used up pretty fast. So uh, we moved on to the next one. Let's do it clandestinely, at night, under the cover of darkness. Break in, remove the 1A files, take them out to a safe place, and burn them. Well, back then, there was no computers. It was all paper. So if you burned their paper, that really kind of was a, a real problem for them. <laughs> <laughs> The East Coast Conspiracy, we learned our robbery skills. Yes, this is true. Uh, I learned to be a good burglar. I learned about casing, about surreptitious entrance at night, about exiting in such fashions that you would be invisible and so on, from, are you ready? Nuns and priests. <laughs> this is true, nuns and priests. Ah, I really found out about Catholic nuns. Oh, boy. <laughs> Bill Davidon called us uh, in uh, early December of 1970 uh, and said, uh, come on out to the house in Haverford. Uh, I have something to dis discuss. We got there. There were 10 people beside ourselves, oh, including ourselves. And Bill suggested, uh, well, what do you think about robbing the FBI? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> but the more we thought about it, the more we realized that Washington was not going to do the job Washington was supposed to do. Washington would sit there and suck their thumb while J. Edgar Hoover pursued his police state practices without supervision, without accountability. And that meant, since Washington would do their job, we the citizens had to do something that Washington should have done but wasn't going to do. So, slowly but surely, we began to consider this idea. And there was, back then, small <laughs> offices of the FBI. One was in Media, Pennsylvania. We began to do casing on Media, Pennsylvania uh, office. It was in the second floor of an apartment house with people living up above. Uh, the front entrance, back then, was not locked at night. There were no surveillance cameras. It was located directly across the street from the uh, courthouse, county courthouse, uh, there in Media. It was a very well lit area. There was a guard 24 hours a day uh, at the front steps of that, uh, of that courthouse. And he had a direct view of the entrance that we would have to go into uh, to uh, enter the FBI office uh, in that apartment house. We did our casing for nighttime activities. There were people there living up on the third and fourth floor of that building. We needed to know when they came, if they left again, when they came back, when they got up in the morning. We had to know the patterns of, of car activity, especially police car activity, around that area and so on. We had all of that down rather precisely. We were good robbers. Uh, uh, but there was one thing that we had to do. We had to get information on the inside of that office during business hours. 
We had to find out if there were electronic security devices or if the cabinets where the files were uh, had uh, security locks. My wife, Bonnie, was elected to be the one who would do that. Her cover story was she was a uh, graduating senior from Swarthmore College, uh, which is right nearby at Media, uh, and wanted to find out uh, from the agent, a uh, local agent in charge, what were the possibilities of a career in the FBI. And so she put her long dark hair up into a bun on top of her hair, put on a hat, uh, wore very big glasses like this, which she never wore, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and she was invited to come uh, to the office. Now this is interesting. The FBI back then was very expert at doing a black bag job on other people, but their arrogance was such that they could not conceive that somebody would in fact case them and rob them. For example, that agent in charge who greeted my wife, Bonnie, didn't even ask her to produce identification. <laughs> he never noticed that she never took off her gloves. <laughs> Arrogance always ends up stupid. Uh, thank God. By the way, that's important. Uh, power, when it becomes arrogant, becomes sloppy and stupid. And that's the hope for those of us who want to change things that power and privilege try to impose upon us. So Bonnie discovered there were no electronic devices. The uh, cabinets uh, were not locked in any fashion. And when we had that information, it was a green light. We had to pick a night. There was a very interesting night coming up, March 8th, 1971. Remember what happened March 8th, 1971? Does that give you a clue? What fight was on? <laughs> Ali and Fraser. It was the fight of the century. And we were pretty sure that the folks in the apartment above, the, in the rooms above the, the FBI office would be listening to that on the radio. We were pretty sure the cops would not be doing very much patrolling, and we were actually very right about that. <laughs> <laughs> so four of us, dressed in business attire, carrying suitcases, not one of me, not Bonnie, others of the eight, entered the office after using a crowbar to break a door open, entered the office, and took all the files, all the files and left, and took those files to a safe house about an hour west of the city, where early in the morning on March 9th, we began to sort those files. Very quickly, we discovered we had done something not in vain. We discovered files that showed and documented in their own handwriting the dirty tricks of J. Andrew Hoover's secret FBI. The FBI that nobody else outside the FBI, certainly nobody in the Congress, nobody in the Senate, I'm not even sure anybody in the White House knew what COINTELPRO was. We didn't know what it was at the time either. There was a document, wonderful, from Hoover to his agents in and around Philadelphia saying, Increase surveillance. That will increase the paranoia. This is a direct quote. That will increase the paranoia that, this, that these kind of folks are, are partial to. Get them to think that there is an FBI agent behind every mailbox. End quote. That's a direct quote. That was in the document. When we got that document, we knew we had the evidence we needed to know. We needed to have because it showed that the Federal Bureau of Investigation under J. Edgar Hoover had become the Federal Bureau of Intimidation under J. Edgar Hoover and were violating the First Amendment rights uh, of citizens like you. We mailed those files in three separate mailings to two politicians, Senator McGovern 
and Congressman uh, Bellum uh, to three newspapers, the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Washington Post. All of them except the Washington Post immediately returned those files to J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. Yeah. And at the Washington Post, there was a huge fight. No news organization back then had ever been faced with the question, what do you do with stolen federal documents? It raised all sorts of legal issues that they'd never been confronted with before. Catherine Graham, the, the publisher of, of the Washington Post, said no, I, I, I'm, I'm, with her legal advisor, says no, 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 let, let's send them back. But the two editors, Ben Bradley and Ben Baddickian, were very forceful in saying, this is the most important story that we'll have in years because it documents what that powerful institution, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover was doing that was clearly unconstitutional and in fact illegal. By 10 o'clock on the night of the 23rd of March, Betty Metzger, who was the one who received those documents, was given the green light. And the next day on the front page, it appeared. And of course, once those documents became known publicly, well, the Washington Post opened the door. And right away, running through that door was the New York Times, <laughs> the Boston Globe, uh, the LA Times, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, the whole gang was all of a sudden, and even con some congressmen and senators found a voice in that land of silence called Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> a few of them started to call for an investigation. It's time for a congressional investigation of the investigators. Never had happened before. Never had happened. The most important document was not recognized by us or anybody else back then. It was a document that had at the top COINTELPRO dash new left. Nobody knew what that meant. Nobody knew what that meant unless they were inside and deep inside the hierarchy of the FBI. But Carl Stern, an NBC reporter, noticed that COINTELPRO dash new left and it was the top of a document that had at the bottom instructions from FBI headquarters to their local agents here in, media, here in, in this area that they should write anonymous letters to the presidents of Villanova, Haverford, and Swarthmore telling them that they should increase their surveillance uh, and, uh, and, 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 and toughness on uh, these new left kind of persons. Well, Carl Stern saw that and said, what? FBI agents writing anonymous letters to college presidents? Well, what's going on here? That was around 1973. He began to use the Freedom of Information Act saying, I want to know what this COINTELPRO is all about. Well, of course, he was, uh, he was stopped. It was, so no, 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 it's all national security. We can't have that. No, 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 no. So finally he took it to a judge. And the judge looked at the files and said, there's nothing on national security here. You've got to give Stern the files. And he got the files. And then the story of COINTELPRO got out. We learned about Martin Luther King being uh, blackmailed. We learned about Hollywood actresses like Jean Seaver being blackmailed, pursued, her career ruined, finally committing suicide. We learned that marriages were destroyed and that the FBI was proud of it. We learned careers were destroyed and the FBI was proud of it because it would make people afraid of the FBI and that's what they wanted. That would be their power. Well, Senator Church from Idaho, for the first time, formed a congressional committee 
in 1975 to investigate the FBI and the CIA and what they were doing. And as a result of that, new rules for the first time were imposed upon the FBI and the CIA in terms of what they could do and not do. First Amendment uh, rights uh, were for a while protected. Then came 9-11 and the Patriots Act. The doors swung open, came wide open. Anything you need, anything you can do to get us information, go ahead. So NSA, CIA, FBI, it began, but this time in spades. I mean, the technology that J. Edgar Hoover had available was nothing. Now, the new technology. The great, the great vacuum cleaner up in the, in the sky is going <laughs> <laughs> sucking up all of your emails, sucking up all of your Facebook, sucking up uh, all of your, uh, uh, yeah, all of your Twitter, uh, all of those things that you think uh, is just between you and who you're sending it to. No, 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 no. Now we're going to have a Q and A in, in just a few minutes, or, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. But you know, of course, don't you, that it's all being listened to. <laughs> I mean, you think that you're, you think you've turned off your your, your iPhone? Uh uh There's good news on iPhones, by the way. Apple has decided to not design in their Apple 6. That code that allowed Apple to turn on your phone and you'd never know it. They decided, no, we're not gonna build that in anymore. That way that when NASA or CIA comes and says, we need to have the information on your email and all the rest, Apple can say, well, sorry, <laughs> we can't turn it on, you know. So, uh, so if you've got a six, for a while you're safe. Well, for a while, more or less. <laughs> but anything less than six, uh, they're listening to you right now. <laughs> so go ahead and ask a question, whatever you have in, in mind. Uh, what we did in 1971 was get information to the public that the public needed to have if we, the citizens, were to have the information we needed to have to tell Washington what Washington would do and not do. And for a while, that worked. Well, thank God for a man named Edward Snowden. Because in 2013, he did the same thing. Uh, he was a whistleblower. He was a truth teller. And he got the documents to us, the citizens of the United States, that we need to have if we're going to be citizens of the United States and tell Washington what we, the citizens of the United States, decide Washington should do and should not do. That's our right, a right that's violated by excessive secrecy at the very top of the game in Washington, D.C. I'll end with this. It's not over, folks. Your generation is going to face the same thing we faced. Because the game of power and privilege is always the same. Make the big decisions off stage, behind closed doors. That's where the big decisions are most effective. That's where privilege and power protects itself most effectively. Some of you are going to have to be whistleblowers in your time. Because the game of power and privilege will not change. They will always do whatever they have to do to protect their power and their privilege. We, the citizens, must always, once again, still again, and again and again, say, nope, we're going to find out what's going on behind that door, thanks. And then we'll decide what you should do and shouldn't do. Thank you.